Okay, I'm going to uh, start this tape uh, with a few minutes of uh, another tape I did uh, instructing people how to use a, a diagnostic infrared thermography. Uh, this is quite a machine, and uh, basically it's a machine that detects, it detects heat patterns. Uh, it, can, it sees heat, surface heat. And so when we're looking at a horse's legs or feet or uh, any part of the horse, we can see unusual heat patterns that suggest that something underlying that uh, excess heat is inflamed or getting extra, extra blood uh, for repair. And therefore, we can locate where the problem is in a horse that is difficult to diagnose. I want you to see how this uh, machine works. Uh, and then uh, we'll come back and, uh, and talk about uh, this diagnostic process, how to find out what's, what's going wrong. Now here's an interesting situation. <clears throat> You're looking at a, a fracture in a standard bred's leg, and actually in a standard bred that was being treated for a, a, a splint the fellow had uh, injected and blistered and fired a splint the horse was uh, quitting at the end of a race, and he couldn't determine uh, what was wrong. Now, notice that this uh, temperature in the area of the fracture is very low uh, compared to the rest of the leg. Everything else is off scale to the high except for this uh, cold area, and generally in a fracture, quite often you'll see a very distinct line across the cannon bone where above it it's warm and below it it's cold. And in this case, I told him to, he had already x-rayed the cannon bone, and I said, well, uh, get a xerography. You'll probably see a fracture. And sure enough, uh, when he did, he he did get the, get the fracture indication. So sometimes uh, any, you know, any abnormality, uh, whether it's hot or cold, can mean something. Here we're looking at uh, a, a shot from the rear. We're looking at two rear legs and, a, and one front leg, all with very active uh, ankles, wraparounds uh, to the rear. But notice that these uh, problems seem to be on the lateral, on the outside, probably suspensory involved, involved in a horse that has uh, uh, some unbalance uh, in the feet causing these outside suspensories to to go. Uh, the feet themselves are inflamed uh, more than we want to see. Generally at the heel you'll see a round area that uh, will be hot and the rest of the foot will be much much cooler. In this case we don't have that. <clears throat> this is what a splint looks like on that uh, left front leg. Usually a splint comes out as a, a round, uh, circular hot spot. Notice we have the arrowhead appearance uh, that we talked about before for shins. Uh, and sh in, in these cases, when you have a splint or when you have a shin problem, both cases cause those two little blood vessels to light up and, and you get this arrowhead appearance. But the hot spot says splint. The rest of the leg is relatively normal. There's no real hot spots in there. We see the uh, circulatory path going down through uh, the leg. That's all relatively normal. Down at the ankle, we don't see any real suspensory involvement. Uh, on this horse, you'd just call a splint. Now here's a foot with uh, a heel that is uh, in trouble. Uh, when you look at the underside of a foot, sometimes you'll see this where you've got an imbalance. In this case, it's the inside of the uh, foot. And notice that how this shoe, that's the black circle there ringing around. Notice how this shoe comes up underneath the heel. And when, I, when you turn a shoe in, 
like that, you're liable to get too much pressure, especially when the heel is hitting first, and if it's hitting on first on the uh, in the area where you see the inflammation, that shoe wrap around underneath the heel will punch up into the heel and cause more problems than it than it solves. Preferably, you'd rather see these heels go, the shoe heels go straight back, uh, rather than curling in underneath and and uh, impinging on the on the softer part of the of the foot. This horse has probably got a very sore foot. Here's another foot with uh, the other, uh, again this is probably the inside, uh, but you notice that the sole of the foot toward the front of the foot has a, pro a problem. This is probably not caused by a shoe. Uh, this is probably a, a bruise or possibly an infection in the area of the heat right there where the uh, cross is. Uh, Otherwise, on the on the right side of the foot here, uh, that's a relatively normal uh, circulatory pattern. However, the whole sole of this foot is warmer than we would like to see it. Uh, the area where the X is, though, probably if you looked in there and uh, cut away in there, you'd probably find some kind of a pus pocket. This is an interesting thing. Here is a horse that has a vein or an artery that goes around the outside of the tendon. Once in a while you see this, uh, don't let it scare you, it's, uh, and always check when you see something like this, this is not a bowed tendon. This is uh, probably an artery or a vein. Uh, he was born with this. Uh, it passes around the outside of the tendon, and these things can be like varicose veins. They can be real uh, sore and hot and inflamed, but it's probably not going to cause the horse any trouble in terms of uh, racing and performance. Okay, here is a set of shins. On the on your left, the horse's right side, it looks like a bandage artifact, but, uh, but it's not. On the left side now, we've moved our temperature scan up and we can see exactly where this uh, problem is. This is likely to be a fracture. Um, the area right there you could pinpoint, you could put a chalk mark on it uh, for the vet to say, to tell the vet this is where to take your x-ray because that's, that's where the problem is. Uh, very, very likely to be a fracture of the uh, cannon bone. That's quite a machine, isn't it? Uh, there are a lot of tools like that that are uh, available. The ultrasound sector scanners are out there. Heart rate monitors can help tell you what's going wrong or indicate that something is going wrong. But um, what we fail to do in training our racehorses uh, is to get diagnostics uh, when there is the slightest hint of something going wrong. Um, that's the problem at the racetrack. Uh, veterinary medicine is relatively well de developed, at least in the universities, but at the racetrack, uh, basically we're, we're practicing 16th century dentistry. Uh, we're uh, going after uh, symptoms, we're pretending that we're curing uh, problems when actually we don't even know what the problems are really because no one is taking the time to fully diagnose, uh, I don't want to say no one, but for the most part, especially in the, from the trainer's point of view, uh, we tend to ignore signs until we've got critical signs and by the time we've got critical signs, dramatic signs of lameness, uh, the horse's career is generally over. So we have to uh, come in earlier than that with diagnostics, uh, find out what is wrong, uh, treat the injury, but also um, find out the cause, correct the cause, and then uh, gradually bring the horse back uh, whole again and uh, back into full training. Uh, 
if we don't uh, correctly diagnose, then we certainly can't find the cause of something that we don't know what it is. So diagnostics is the first uh, part of this, this whole program. Uh, the infrared thermography machine is real expensive. It's a $33,000 uh, machine uh, made by Hughes Aircraft for other purposes besides uh, racehorses. Um, still, it's a very useful tool and, and should be in the veterinarian's repertory of uh, th things to use to diagnose. And some vets have them, but very, very few across the country. The remarkable thing that I discovered using this machine is that uh, standard bred trainers uh, in general liked the idea of, of the machine. Uh, it was uh, the injuries that standard breds experience for the most part are less dramatic than those in thoroughbreds and when thoroughbreds experience injuries uh, they're much more sensitive to them and have to stop racing and sometimes their careers are ended very early uh, because uh, the, the degree of injury is uh, pretty uh, catastrophic in, in thoroughbreds most of the time. So an injured thoroughbred is a non-racehorse uh, and its career is, is very likely over for the most part. In standard breds we can keep uh, semi-cripples running for an awful long time uh, because we can uh, go after the injury, treat it to an extent, do some shoeing, do some uh, injections of uh, whatever and um, come out with a horse that can race Saturday afternoon. But the, the real test of our abilities to uh, preserve and enhance our racehorses is the longevity of their racing careers. How long can we keep a horse uh, running and viable uh, by way of detecting problems, uh, eliminating the causes, uh, rehabilitating the horse, and uh, bringing him back to a racehorse. That's uh, real tricky to do and uh, the diagnostics is the front end of it. If you, for example, if you've got a horse that's off, you can, you can make a lot of guesses. Uh, it's like you take your car to the uh, garage and you say, hey, my motor skips. And so the uh, technician starts replacing parts and if you're in warranty, if, if you've got a car that General Motors is paying for the uh, bill, then you and the uh, technician can go through every part in that automobile, replacing each one until finally something clicks and you've got a brand new uh, engine uh, happening. And half the time you do have a brand new engine in there. but. Uh, horses aren't that way. Uh, you can't replace their parts. They have to either repair them or they're damaged uh, permanently. So uh, when we start fooling around uh, with corrections to problems that we don't even understand as, as to what they are, uh, all we can all we can expect is more damage and eventually a cripple that uh, can't race at all and is worth nothing to anyone no matter if we spent a thousand or five thousand dollars on quote repairs of that uh, of that racehorse I'll, I'll give you an example of this uh, <clears throat> in New York there was a horse racing at Yonkers that um, had been fired and blistered and injected uh, for a splint. Now, uh, he was still sore, and he was sore weeks and weeks after all of this uh, process had been done. And in fact, the process has been done several times and until at the splint area there was a, just a big mound of scar tissue uh, through the treatments that had been used uh, by the vet. Now I took this infrared thermography machine up and uh, used it to look at this horse's legs and what I saw was across the front of the leg uh, a depression uh, in the temperature uh, and in fact you'll, you're seeing it on this uh, videotape, a depression in the uh, on the front of the shin where there should have been a warm temperature throughout and instead there was a very cold spot right in the middle of it. And I said, 
uh, boy, uh, from my experience, this, this looks like a fracture. And uh, you better get it x-rayed. Uh, the vet was real angry that I had come up with that, uh, quote, diagnos diagnosis and uh, refused to x-ray the horse and uh, he said he had already x-rayed and found nothing and there's no reason to go back over uh, old ground. Uh, we Then I advised the person to uh, not only get an x-ray but why not, if we're going to get an x-ray, why not use a, a xerographic x-ray, which a xerographic x-ray looks like a blueprint uh, as opposed to a gray and white uh, and black uh, regular x-ray plate. And so we did uh, get someone to do a xerographic x-ray on the horse. And there was a crack in that bone that went at least a half an inch into the bone. Uh, whether or not the horse was going to snap off that leg or not, who knows, but the people had paid the veterinarian $1,800 over a period of time to treat this, quote, splint, uh, when re and then uh, keep on training him and race him, racing him, uh, and the horse wasn't doing very well, although he would go out and race and he would try uh, to be competitive, but uh, wasn't winning anything, and that's why I was calling in just to look at it further. <clears throat> but it's it's a case of uh, let's really find the problem, okay? Let's really not guess. Uh, and a lot of times we don't even go to the veterinarian. We sit and look at the horse and say, well, he must have a stone bruise, or uh, well, he's uh, we're going to shoo him out of this. Uh, we're going to correctively shoo this uh, pain away, or uh, we'll go to the vet and we'll say, hey, doc. Uh, inject them in the hock, inject them in the ankle, inject them in the whatever. And most of the time we're not, not even asking the vet what it is we're injecting. Uh, and more often than not, what we are injecting is corticosteroids, which are um, drugs that uh, make the injured part look great because it sucks down all the inflammation. Now, the inflammation is there Horses have a, a kind of hyperreactive immune system. When something goes wrong, uh, all sorts of swelling and heat start to take place, uh, A, for repair, but B, for immobilization of the limb. In other words, when that ankle starts to go bad, the horse's body wants to freeze it, wants to uh, freeze the joint so it can't flex and therefore do more damage, and maybe the horse will live longer than if he keeps going like he is and doesn't feel any pain, then uh, eventually that joint will just wear out and the foot will fall off. So the horse's body is hyperactive in, uh, in its immune system reaction to injuries. Uh, <laughs> we're hypoactive when we when we see this. First of all, uh, we don't want to believe that it's there. Uh, we don't want to believe that it's just not going to go away all by itself and we just keep on going and maybe back off a few days, but as soon as that swelling is down, then we'll just go right on. Or we want to, we start thinking in terms of, gee, uh, maybe I can hit it with something and uh, we'll race on Saturday, pick up another thousand dollars maybe in that race, and if he lives through that, then uh, maybe we can race next Saturday as well until pretty soon we're into a routine where we're hitting that joint with uh, corticosteroids every time we go. Uh, the horse feels no pain, the leg looks good, and we can just close our eyes and dream that this horse is all better now. Uh, the truth of the matter is that corticosteroids uh, inhibit healing uh, in the joints uh, or in the tendons. In the tendons and soft tissues, uh, it uh, confuses the tissues and, and makes parts of them turn to bone. You, you end up with tendons with little buttons of bone all up and down on where they've been injected. And of course, that uh, takes the elasticity out of the tendon and makes it more subject to tearing and, and breaking, so we hasten the uh, the real serious injury of the, of the tendon or ligament that we're treating with corticosteroids. Um, in joints, uh, corticosteroids melt cartilage as if it were 
airplane glue attacking plastic. Uh, it just melts the cartilage uh, away and disturbs the surface of the cartilage and ripples the surface of the cartilage and over a period of time then uh, the joint uh, it wreaks havoc on the joint. And not only that, but uh, corticosteroids uh, have a kind of a systemic effect, effect where cartilage throughout the body uh, is uh, being destroyed by these even if they're locally injected. Right now there are several hockey players and some football players that are suing their professional teams because uh, their joints were, or an injury like an, an elbow or a shoulder was treated with corticosteroids uh, so that they could play every game and now they're quadriplegics. Their joints and their hips and their joints and their shoulders are completely worn away. They're in great pain and they can't move. They just can't move uh, due to corticosteroid treatment. So over the long haul, then, we have uh, uh, cover-up treatments that do damage. Butazolidin, for example, is a cover-up treatment that does damage. You, you would think that, uh, well, but fights inflammation. And, you know, we get this ice bucket out with our leg wraps and uh, pour ice water over those uh, legs, which is a very good treatment for treating <coughs> swelling. You want to keep that immune system relatively under control so it doesn't do damage to the parts that it's invading, but uh, bute is, one of, is, a, is a kind of an anti-inflammatory, kind of a little bit like aspirin, but uh, stronger than aspirin, and also uh, a drug that causes uh, mucous membrane lesions, and that means in the throat, it means down into the lungs, it means in the gut and the digestive tract. Any place where there are surface tissues that are coated uh, with mucus, uh, butazolidin causes sores to form in there. And so uh, horses that are on bute for more than five to seven days for uh, attacking a uh, high-grade inflammation uh, will tend to develop ulcers, uh, throat lesions that bleed and make us think that the horse is bleeding from the lungs, uh, sinus lesions. Uh, all sorts of that kind of problem uh, just by extended use of butte. So the guy, that, the trainer that says, hey, two butte tabs a day keeps the doctor away is dreaming. Uh, not so. Two butte tabs a day eventually uh, is going to cause a bleeder and infections, throat infections, sinus infections, all sorts of uh, problems. Um, we have uh, veterinarians that uh, will inject uh, in the jugular vein some kind of help. Now, uh, some of them are honest and don't use these French drugs or the Canadian drugs that come down from Quebec uh, that are I exotically tailored to uh, uh, not be detected, uh, but they will stick in something that they can sell for $100, and it's usually vitamin, mineral, enzymes, you know, whatever they're going to call it. They try to put everything in the kitchen sink into that pre-race uh, jug. Um, the trouble with jugs is that uh, besides whatever the drugs are doing or whatever the, the, the cornucopia of uh, crap that they're sticking down there jugular, uh, whatever those do, uh, we know for sure that um, sticking a needle into the jug uh, causes red blood cells to coagulate, to pass down through the heart, and grab onto the heart wall, uh, eventually pull away and leave a lesion there, uh, coagulate, go down to the lungs, plug up the lungs. I told you about this in the early t earlier tape, but, you know, things like this that we <clears throat> that we don't think of. Uh, sticking a needle into a joint is a big event for that joint, a huge event for that joint. And wiggling around and scraping off this and scraping off that uh, causes uh, the synovial mem membrane to become inflamed, causes foreign particles to be, you know, no matter how careful you are, playing around inside of a joint is playing around inside uh, uh, an area that can become infected very rapidly. It doesn't have a whole lot of blood supply to move garbage in and out. Instead, you put something in there and it's going to hang around. I mean, just a piece of skin that you punch inward 
is going to hang around and cause an inflammation that, uh, or possibly cause an inflammation that eventually kills the horse because once you get uh, an infected joint, a septic joint, uh, the horse's life is over. Uh, and that can happen with any invasive fooling around with a joint capsule. So even, uh, you know, hyaluronic acid is a, is a real good treatment for uh, a horse's knees or ankles or hocks that uh, have had uh, enough wear and tear on them that, they, that the synovial membrane uh, is inflamed, it's not passing the, the right fluids back and forth, the synovial uh, synovia uh, is getting thin and watery and not providing the lubrication between the surfaces of the bones and the joint and uh, the horse needs uh, relubrication there, and that's what hyaluronic acid does. It's a lubricant. Uh, we have another drug called Adequan, which tends to make cartilage uh, re-nourish itself or feed itself at, in a, at a faster rate, and uh, therefore rebuild, uh, not real fast, not overnight, not next week, but quickly, uh, normalize and rebuild and this kind of settles joints down and, and strengthens the cartilage and it's a real good drug but we used to be sticking it in there with uh, a needle right directly into the joint and the joint would blow up from uh, that kind of an injection and so then we were mixing it with corticosteroids. We're still mixing hyaluronic acid with corticosteroids for the same reason. So at, on the one hand we're throwing in a useful product, and on the other hand, we're throwing in a product with it that destroys the joint. Uh, this kind of uh, stupidity is uh, commonplace um, because nobody's really thinking. Nobody's really thinking deeper than the shallow surface. Can we fix them, and how quick? And how quick can we get back uh, making uh, making money with a horse? Um, when you uh, Adequan can be used in the muscle now, and that's good because uh, its benefits can be realized without uh, invading the joint. But overall, what you want to be thinking about is, look, the best healer is Mother Nature. The best healer is time uh, and some exercise in some cases. For example, buck shins and thoroughbreds, you can heal in 35 days if you start out with just gradual uh, exercise increases and at, at 35 days you're back to where you were. But you sure as hell better x-ray that shin and make sure you don't have a fracture going through it because if you have a fracture going through it then uh, you're, you're fooling yourself uh, in, in terms of being able to repair something much more simple like a, like a buck shin. So these are complex machines. Uh, we can't uh, pretend that we are uh, doctors, and if we are doctors, if we're veterinary people, uh, then we should use our uh, skills and talents and knowledge to really diagnose, find out precisely what we're treating, uh, and then eliminate the cause. Now, that's the second second problem. I mean, and that goes, that goes back to this record-keeping thing. Um, what are your horse's toe angles and toe lanes? Do you know? Do you know precisely what it is? How much does your horse weigh? Do you know? Uh, what exact exercise did you do and what were the speeds not only of the training days but the jog days and, and are they written down and are you comparing them with the other horses that you've done for the last 10 years and are you dropping faster with this horse than any other horse and if so, why? Are you dropping slower with this horse uh, than any other horse and if so, why? Uh, what's the normal jogging heart rate of this horse, and how fast is that jog? Uh, what have been the treatments uh, precisely? I mean, drug names and how many CCs, uh, I mean, you, and this on a record, on some kind, of, maybe on a computer record, but some kind of a record that's continuous that you can look back on and say, "Ooh, two weeks ago we saw this kind of a thing coming on, and here is the X-ray, and here is the thermography picture, and here is the the blood enzymes that were." showing us, uh, and here are his toe lengths, and gee, can you see we had a 47 degree angle on that left front, we had a 49 on the right front, both of them too damn low, but that 47 is what bowed that tendon. 
Okay. Uh, if you don't have records, then you can't project forward, nor can you analyze where you are right now. And so our, uh, our, my statement to you is that uh, we have to think deeper about these things that go wrong. Now, when I, th when I think uh, that something is going uh, wrong with a horse, um, and we'll talk about strictly about uh, physical problems right now, um, I always start thinking feet first because, uh, first of all, most of the time it's in the front legs. Uh, sometimes it, it reaches back later on. Uh, but it starts in the front legs and it's usually low down. It's either going to be in the feet or in the fetlock. Um, seldom does it go uh, to the knee on a, on a horse for, uh, except after a long period of uh, racing, unless the ho horse takes a big misstep. In babies, uh, you might see some epiphysitis uh, where the knee gets a dent in it. What we call open knees, or what I see trainers calling open knees, are something other than <clears throat> uh, growth plates that aren't closed. Uh, what we have there is this indentation in the knee. Uh, and really what it is is two lips at the top and the bottom of the knee, the growth plate areas have become inflamed and swollen uh, in babies. Now this is a, this is a real bad uh, situation because when they become inflamed like that, uh, they're not growing properly and we're liable to get into an osteochondrosis state where part of that cartilage, normally when a bone is growing, cartilage will die and become bone and then uh, the bone keeps on growing on top of the or just underneath the cartilage as the cartilage dies and then uh, grows some more. But when they become inflamed the cartilage doesn't die. These growth plates, part, parts of the growth plates, the parts that are irritated don't die. They stay alive but other parts around them do die and turn to bone and the bone keeps growing, but it leaves a pocket of empty space behind where once was living cartilage that was irritated and staying alive too long. Now that's kind of rotted away, and you get a hole the size of a marble at the top of the cannon bone just as it's going into the knee or in parts of the knee joint itself that eventually breaks away and becomes, quote, a chip, or B, becomes a fracture that uh, maybe brings the horse down on, on the racetrack. But, so this epiphysitis in babies, uh, which is the one thing that happens in the knee joints that uh, is rather common, uh, has to, you have to right then stop, get that back to normal before going on. And if your workload, if you're doing too much work and it's irritating those growth plates, you have to back way off until you get that swollen area down. And you just don't look at those knees and say, quote, open knees, hey, uh, in terms of real open knees and closed knees, there's no difference in the level or the number of injuries that will occur to either one in the knee. But swollen epiphyses uh, lead to damage that is real long term. I mean, you've got a growing horse that's going to get defects in its bone if you continue to do what you're doing. So those kinds of things have to be taken care of. However, normally, it's lower down where the problems are happening. Uh, points of crisis are all parts of the foot. Sesamoids, big, I mean, when something goes wrong at the sesamoids, you've got trouble that's going to be there forever, and it'll probably stop you right now. Um, tendons and ligaments, uh, suspensory ligaments. Suspensory is is uh, from this this kind of an action. If you take a bad misstep and throw, uh, hit with one side or the other and bend that uh, ankle, then you'll blow a suspensory. But we can we blow suspensory real easy by getting that damn toe too long and in the breakover process when we get up on the top of that toe because it's so long and it takes us so long to get back there we've got a horse that's been dwelling on that toe for a long time and it's been rocking back and forth on that and we can blow a suspensory from having too long a toe. Behind the pastern bone 
is uh, a group of ligaments called the XYZ ligaments. If we're uh, wearing shoes and, and feet that are too low at an angle and too long a toe, another part of the foot that uh, or the leg that starts to act up and get hot is uh, back behind the uh, pastern bone where we get scratches. Scratches are not the problem we're talking about here, uh, but in that area, uh, that'll heat up and swell up a little bit. And when that area swells up, one of the things you know for sure is that the whole suspensory system, including the deep flexor and the superficial flexor, are all getting extra stress because we're uh, allowing that front foot to dwell too long on the ground. And it, as it gets back here to the breakover point where it has to break over, it's delayed and it snaps over and all of those uh, systems get uh, overstretched. Uh, not only that, but the knee backs in, the knee over dorsal flexes. So when the leg's coming down, it goes clear back here, the knee is bending the way it can't bend. And so we start to get irrita irritations at the lips of that joint, top and bottom. And that third carpal bone stuck there in the middle gets squeezed and pinched. And that's the bone that usually has the fracture or usually starts to get the uh, excess cartilage wear. All that's happening because we've got too long a toe and too low an angle. Uh, a lot of the time, that's, that's why it's happening. Uh, so it, the problem, the cause of a knee can be a foot problem, uh, a shoeing problem. So uh, when, we're, uh, when we've diagnosed a knee, then our job is to figure out, well, how come a knee? I mean, why out of the blue is this horse experiencing a knee? And then we start checking our numbers. Uh, we start looking at the toe angles and toe lengths. Uh, we look at how quickly did we drop this horse compared to the other ones. Uh, how many miles has this horse got going around this turn this way? Uh, uh, compared to the other horses that are still sound. Does this horse have something wrong with its way of going? Now, you've seen these videotapes in the earlier uh, uh, part of this series of tapes that uh, show you that a video camera, like the one I'm using right here, which is just a consumer high 8 uh, camera that has a high-speed shutter on it, I can sit down with that, with that camera and look at frame by frame, and we're talking uh, 60 frames a second, Okay, so every 60th of a second, I can see what's happening to uh, the foot swing and the stance time and the air time and the rollover time on these uh, on the legs of my horses. I can see the foot fly through the air like this and come down, either right or wrong or imbalanced or or whatever. I can use that infra infra infrared thermography machine to look at the heat patterns in the foot and see that, boy, this inside is taking a lot of punishment because it's really inflamed because it's, the horse is coming down on that heel every time. And not only that, but when it comes down on that heel, that foot is flopping over like this and it throws stress, extra stress, on this outside suspensory. I can pr project all that and then I can see all that with my infrared machine. If I do not correct that problem, I'm back to square one. This, as soon as I bring the horse back out, if I've got some philosophy about lowering this and raising the, this whole corrective shoeing concept has gone too far, we're, we're believing that we can correct everything and we can't. And when we do try to correct these things, we bollocks up a whole lot of other uh, problems that we would, never would have encountered if we haven't, hadn't thought that, gee, my shoer can cure any disease known man, to mankind. Now, the shoer may think that he can, and he may tell you that he can, just like your veterinarian may tell you that he can, but they're both full of it because <sighs> problems aren't that easily corrected. There's no magic answer. Uh, so when something goes wrong, uh, the first job is to start with the feet, the front feet, more often than not, and uh, look for problems there, uh, and then work your way up the leg. Uh, sesamoids are critical problems. Suspensories um, can heal, but they're long-term healing. They got, they've got less circulation than the uh, tendons and ligaments. A bowed tendon is generally a big, big problem. Generally, we don't pay attention uh, soon enough. We're so busy covering up these uh, swellings and fillings with leg wraps and blisters and firing that we never really can look under the surface. That's the trouble with, uh, uh, a lot of trouble with the standard bread uh, treatments is that we rely so much on these blisters. Uh, 
and, and firing, uh, thinking they do good. Science says that none of that does any good. Uh, meanwhile, it's masking or hiding what's underneath there that's actually going on. We should be doing diagnostic. We should have, if we've got a tendon problem, instead of firing it or blistering it or uh, wrapping it in a poultice and trying to suck all the juices out of it so that, so that it looks normal to us and that, and that we with good conscience can go on and uh, race the horse on Saturday. What we should be doing is taking a sector scanner, ultrasound sector scanner, and looking at that tendon, see how exactly how damaged it is, and then rehabilitate, gradually bringing the horse back to full soundness, and it might take, uh, well, it uh, according to science, it takes 262 days for those tendon fibers to come back to full normality, 262 days, okay? So when you bow a tendon, repair is going to be effected in 262 days, not three months, not two weeks, not overnight with a corticosteroid injection, 262 days, okay? Then you have to look at the horse and say, well, he's only a $2,500 claimer. Uh, no use fooling with them. Let's sell them to the Amish, you know. Or uh, hey, he's a he's a good horse that earns about thirty thousand dollars a year. He's only four. Uh, let's give him a year and let that uh, tendon come back. And you can take him out into the pasture, and uh, that tendon will heal in time. And it'll heal fully in time. Now there's a everybody t will tell you that well, once a horse bows a tendon, he'll never come back to where he was. Well. Uh, a, if you catch the tendon as it's being bowed, as opposed to really bowing it uh, by uh, going on with a with a horse that's got tendon swelling, uh, then you can uh, get a fully healed uh, animal in time. Okay, if you if you want to go on with him until he says he can't go any further, well then no matter what's the matter with them, uh, you're guaranteed that that horse's racing career is over. That's your decision. You can decide, you know, if he's a, a junk $2,500 claimer and you've got uh, $2,500 waiting for the next uh, horse to come by that you want to claim, um, race him until he's dead. You know, that's, uh, you can do that, but uh, if you want to preserve the animal, then uh, you have to treat the injury as, as if it's serious and treat small signs of injury as if they're serious. I mean, if you start to get swelling in the uh, uh, fetlock area, then there are almost every veterinarian out there now has ultrasound sector scanners because they can, they can charge you money for them. Uh, and they're quick. They don't have to spend the same kind of time you have to do with a... Uh, uh, an infrared machine, and they require uh, veterinarian diagnostics, but they're because they're just as tricky as X-rays to read, maybe more tricky than X-rays to read. Uh, where the infrared machine, hell, anybody can see where the problem is on it, so there's no no real veterinary expertise necessary, and that's why they don't tend to have that machine around. Still, they've got sec uh, sector scanning ultrasounds that uh, will show you exactly where the lesion is in the suspensory or the deep flexor or the super superficial flexor. They'll even see uh, trouble forming around the uh, sesamoids. Uh, these instruments are available and they should be used and they should be used early on in the process of an oncoming lameness so, so that you can see uh, well this is not a big problem and uh, he can go out and finish out the season or this is a big problem and you do him two more times and he's going to just rip that uh, suspensory right in half. Uh, those things you should know uh, if, if you're concerned about preserving this horse's uh, racing career. Once you do severe damage uh, it is over, uh, whether it's a tendon or whether it's a cracked sesamoid or a cracked uh, knee. You know, anytime a joint explodes, it's over. Anytime a, a tendon or a ligament explodes, it's over. Uh, anytime a sesamoid bone uh, cracks one way or another, it's over. And sesamoids will crack when the tissues around them become too hard that they don't slip around those little pulleys that are the sesamoid bones. Uh, then uh, the sesamoid bones get caught up in the motion of the tendons and ligaments that are usually just going around them and slipping and sliding around them, and when they do, then they crack. 
and uh, usually a, a, a fractured sesamoid bone, unless you've got a shoeing job that lets the horse's heels hit the ground uh, uh, or let the fetlock hit the ground, then uh, then you'll get a sesamoid from that, from concussion. <laughs> Uh, or a horse reaching up from behind and cracking himself because that front foot's not getting out of the way. Uh, another reason why a, a sesamoid can go bad, but usually it's abuse upon abuse upon abuse. And when you see those first signs of swelling, uh, you've got to recognize that that means abuse. Now, when you're working with babies and you start getting stocking up or generalized filling, uh, in the beginning of a baby's track life, uh, they, when you start putting on more sustained work, uh, you're increasing their uh, circulation quite a lot, and sometimes uh, blood or fluids will pool down in the, in the lower legs because the blood vessels down there are not as elastic as they will be eventually, and they don't pump that blood back up the, back up the leg. So uh, sometimes you'll get some uh, cool filling down there. Uh, and when you do, you, you cut your work in half and sneak back up on it, and you'll, you'll go through that. But uh, normally, in the ankles or anywhere that you see heat or swelling, um, you've got an injury that you better deal with. And not only that, but you better uh, discover the cause. And, and nine times out of ten in the standard bread, the cause is uh, either a, a conformational defect or too fast, too soon, or a nutritional, in support of nutrition, I'll talk to you about that in a minute, or shoeing. And boy, there's an awful lot of it today that is strictly shoeing. I mean, you know, maybe 50%, 60% is shoeing and balancing or lack thereof. Uh, look first at the feet. Look first at the feet for cause and for the actual lameness itself. Uh, if you don't feed supportive nutrition, and we're talking protein and carbohydrate to the extent that the horse is using it, in other words, you're feeding the exercise. The more you do, the more you have to feed. You have to have good high protein content. You have to have good carbohydrate content. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, not letting the horse lose weight. If the horse starts losing weight, uh, he's likely to be burning muscle tissue and that's going to make him muscle sore. That's going to make him stiff in the back, stiff in the butt, and it's going to make his rear legs tend to jam into the ground as opposed to stretching forward uh, and grabbing the ground. When they jam, then he throws shocks up into his hock that uh, the hocks don't like and they start to get sore until pretty soon you got a horse. Then he tries to get off his back legs and throws everything onto the front legs that don't need it uh, for sure. Uh, and pretty soon you got a whole circle, this vicious circle of pain that the animal's going through <laughs> that's due to nutrition. Uh, not due to exercise, not due to anything else, but gee, he just got a little bit sore from using, from burning muscle tissue, and then because he got sore and we kept on pushing him, because boy, he looked like he was getting racy, and uh, sure enough, this filly, she goes out there and gee, races around the track because she wants to get the hell off the track and get this out of the way. It's painful. Um, a nutritional defect uh, ends up as uh, a critical uh, injury uh, or a total body injury in, in some cases. I'll tell you a little story. Um, we just recently had a, a thoroughbred racing out here that um, the uh, owner trainer of it was just delirious about how this horse looked. He was in love with this horse. He thought it was, uh, it was a son of secretariat, uh, definitely a real good looking, good striding animal, uh, fed to uh, a T, uh, trained real well, but, uh, and was doing some, some occasional back-to-back -back heats uh, and some strong mileage um, but it was another case of it's time to race uh, or it's going to be time to race real quick here so uh, let's skip over some of this stuff and go right down to the last couple of taper outs and and see what we've got because he looks so beautiful and he strides so beautifully and he's so aggressive and and all this stuff so he was asking me before this horse raced, he says, well, uh, uh, 
what do you, I think he's going to win, and he's going to win by 10 lengths. And I was hesitant to suggest that that was going to happen. Uh, but I let him go on. To me, the horse was shallowly uh, prepped. Uh, again, when you're doing a lot of exercise uh, with a horse, then more and more what you do is what you get. And so if you have a horse that is out there, like this guy was doing uh, four two fifteen miles all at once, uh, and, and two fifteen is not that spectacular for a thoroughbred. That's cruising speed for a thoroughbred. But uh, this guy was thrilled with it because most of the guys are going once around at about uh, 2.45. Uh, so four all together at 2.15 was a real big deal for him. And so he was real encouraged with, with this performance. And he, and he did some short little blowouts, uh, half mile, five-eighths of a mile, three-eighths of a mile, and saw some reasonable speed. Uh, to suggest that this horse sure sure enough can come out of the gate and and deliver it and then uh, at the end of the whole process when he was talking to me he was kind of feeling guilty that he didn't do all the stuff and so he was kind of asking me uh, gee we left out some of that in the middle uh, uh, do you think that uh, he looks like Godzilla do you think that he's going to fly and I was hesitant I said well you, you don't know until you until you run him uh, uh, let's let's just see. So he, he raced a mile, uh, ran for five eighths of a mile, and spit it, and was next to last at the end of the race. And, and uh, I got a call from the guy that day, and he said uh, he lost. Uh, he swallowed his tongue. Okay. Now I knew immediately that that was not true. Uh, not that the guy was lying to me. Uh, the guy was telling me what he thought was the truth. But uh, I, could, I could picture the whole process. The uh, kid gets off the horse, comes up to him and says, boy, he quit at the end. He must have uh, swallowed his tongue. Uh, or uh, the other excuse is he must have bled. Or this or that or this or that, but there's always that step in the hole to three-quarter pole instant solution that forgives you for making conditioning mistakes or shoeing mistakes or, or the other thing. And so this fellow, uh, that was what he told me over the telephone. Uh, and then he set him up to race again one week later. And uh, this time he put a tongue tie on him and uh, raced him again and uh, with uh, the same same exact uh, results. Um, now he called me today and uh, he wants to know what, what to do about it. Um, you know, uh, what to do about it. it should have been done, okay, and then once we we saw the result, we shouldn't have teased ourselves with the idea that, well, miracles will happen, and this was a negative miracle, he swallowed his tongue, so therefore next week it's going to be a positive miracle, he's going to come back and beat him all by 15 lengths. You know, you're telling yourself stories when you do that, and when you blame performance on things other than those that are under your control uh, or lack of performance on things other than what are under your control, uh, you're making a big mistake. And uh, what goes wrong in the process of uh, either scientific training or conventional training is mostly based on this idea that we really don't know what the hell we're doing. We're really not paying attention to what we're doing. Uh, we're not keeping track of what we're doing. And then when something goes wrong, we don't care to investigate what went wrong. And therefore, the end result is that we know nothing and we're blind and we keep stumbling into the same roadblock over and over and over again, dreaming ourselves to sleep, thinking that we know a whole hell of a lot more than we do know. And the only antidote for that is investigation. The only antidote for uh, uh, bloated ego and uh, at the same time uh, uh, an awareness deep down inside that, hey, we're flying blind, and, but everybody else is flying blind, so why don't we just go ahead and fly blind and be one of the guys, and then we can go down to the coffee shop in the morning and bemoan our uh, uh, accidental uh, fate. 
God put his finger on me today and crippled my horse. Uh, what could I do about it? You know, those things happen. Horses die. As long as we retain that attitude, uh, we cannot correct the mistakes that we that we're making over and over again. So, as I'm telling you these stories, the reason I'm telling you that story is so that you'll uh, realize that uh, you've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to be honest with yourself, and you've got to blame yourself, no matter whether it's your fault or not. You've got to decide to take the blame for everything that happens to your horse, because, in truth. You're that horse's God. You are in charge of every step that horse takes, and you are in charge of everything that happens to that horse. And if he gets hurt or if he gets sick, it's your fault. And figure out why. Go back and look at why. Like, for example, all these horses ship up from Florida, and everybody in the barn catches a flu. How come? Happens every year, doesn't it? Your horse, how many times have your horses caught this damn flu when the Florida horses ship up? Isn't that dumb? I mean, that it happens every year after year after year, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of trouble. You shouldn't be near those Florida horses. If they're going to ship in, you move out. You go to some other barn, clear on the other side of the track, and hope the hell the air doesn't bring across this virus that, uh, that they're going to have or that they're going to develop because they're traveling in these confined vans that have no circulation, and they poison themselves in these vans with their own uh, uh, germs floating around the air. Uh, the best way to, to transport a horse is, a, is in a cattle truck. Uh, open uh, stock trailer. Uh, that's the safest way if you want to avoid viruses. But, you know, uh, we accept these these things as our fate. We accept the ability of our horse as our fate. In other words, if he races in 201 this week and races in 201 next week, he's 201. What can I do about it? Except accidentally if he drops down to 159 because he gets sucked, sucked along in a race and doesn't die from that. Uh, then he's a 159 horse. Wow, gee, great. Except the stewards, when they see you go from 01 to 159, they're going to call you a driver in for inconsistent performance. Hey, you raced five races in 201, and all of a sudden you're in 159. You're out of here for 35 days. Inconsistent performance. Stewards are stupid. You know, they don't realize that this, this can happen. They don't want to see it happen. They don't want horses to go up and down, and that's unfortunate. You know, on the one side, they're real afraid that uh, uh, people are going to complain about fixed races and stuff when a horse doesn't do what he's supposed to do, uh, but rather than attack uh, fixed races, they attack the symptom of fixed races, which, uh, which is a horse that dram dramatically improves or dramatically slows down for one reason or another. That's the symptom, but the, the actual uh, problem is two guys or three guys getting together and saying, I'm going to be first, you be second, you be third, and we'll get an exacta for $5,000. You know, that's where the problem is. But it, And it's not, <laughs> quote, inconsistent performance. Be betters, the customers, actually like inconsistent performance. That's why they like thoroughbreds better than standardbreds, because you can't guess uh, which horse is going to be first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth. In standardbreds, it's getting a little bit too pat so that the favorite is uh, winning too often or the top three are winning too often and you can't you don't have these dramatic unexpected uh, things happening that, that happen in thoroughbreds because thoroughbreds are so damn inconsistent they can't race from one week to the next uh, in the same kind of time how do we get into this uh, uh, area let's get back to uh, things that go wrong uh, think of this uh, too fast, too soon sy syndrome as too much belief in your animal and not as enough belief in uh, what you know to be all of the possibilities that can go wrong. You've got an environment with 10,000 possibilities of things going wrong. You see a horse out there that you're so damn glad that he's not limping along. Uh, that you decide, boy, am I lucky this time. Have I got some kind of horse? And the horse comes out and really surprises you and shows you a real nice piece of work, and then you're convinced, solid, you're going to go to the bank with this horse. Uh, that's right when the bad stuff happens. When that horse is taking drop like an anchor, uh, what goes down has to come back up. And if he goes down too damn fast, uh, you will... Uh, pay for that drop at some point in time. So too fast, too soon, especially with 
interval training, which is a, a, a real effective conditioner and can allow these drops uh, to occur too fast. So, you know, you're always on the side of caution. You're always holding back a little. You're always not quite letting him do uh, what he wants to do. If you let him do what he wants to do or you beg him and beg him for more and more because you think that the reason he's going slow is that his mind's not right, uh, you'll make a big error. Uh, it's real bad judgment to uh, be a, a horse psychologist. Um, horses uh, have no real human emotions at all. They, uh, they're they about as smart as dogs. Uh, they're trainable, definitely, uh, but they don't think like you and I think. Uh, and sometimes when I'm talking to you on these tapes, I'll talk as if I'm a horse talking and saying, hey, you're trying to kill me. Uh, they do have primitive emotions, but for the most part, uh, they're not thinking uh, like you might be thinking they're thinking. Uh, for example, they're not thinking of ways to uh, slow down and keep you from winning races, uh, cheating on you. They're not uh, cheating on you. Once in a while, you will find a horse that uh, pretends to limp uh, when he's sound, but those are old war horses. They're eight, nine years into it that really know uh, they're professionals and they really know how to how to trick you. But they're not that that snappy smart that they can figure it out as a two-year-old or a three-year-old or even a four-year-old. Typically, generally, when a, when uh, up to a four or five-year-old, when they show you that they're not willing to go out and deliver. There's a damn good reason, and you better you better listen to it right now. So, blindness is the is the second thing. Don't don't be blind, and at the same time, uh, don't believe everything good your horse to has has to say. Believe everything bad, uh, and notice everything bad very very early when it when it starts to happen, and then don't believe the good. So, you'll help prevent things going wrong or big things going wrong by noticing the small things early on and ignoring the delirious emotions you get when suddenly you get a, a breakthrough workout and you're in two, two already and you're way ahead of everybody else. Uh, you know, being way ahead of everybody else is a big, big, big mistake. Be the last one. Be the last one to two minutes. Be the last one to 2.11. When those charts come out and they show you how wonderfully these big-time babies are doing for Stanley Dancer and for all, the, all these other guys, look at those charts and you'll find that some guys are way ahead of Stanley Dancer, but they're not way ahead of Stanley Dancer at the end of the year, or Billy Houghton. They're not way ahead of Billy Houghton at the end of the year. They think, whoa, hey, Mr. Owner, we got precocious colts here. They're coming along fantastic. Hey. They're coming along too damn fantastic, and that's one of the big things that goes wrong. Okay, let's talk about uh, blood for a minute, uh, blood tests. Um, blood is a river of information, and it can tell uh, a knowledgeable person a lot about what's going on inside the horse's body. Uh, it's not go so good for measuring nutrition, except that when you are uh, sucked down so far that you're burning muscle tissue, then you'll see these uh, uh, muscle enzymes spilling out into the blood. Uh, muscle enzymes like SGOT, um, CPK. CPK is the one that goes is real volatile. It goes up and down. When you have muscle damage, it, it goes way up and then comes down the, the quickest. LDH. Uh, a number of uh, there are a number of muscle enzymes. The trouble is most of our blood tests when we say doc hey take a blood on this guy and see what is going on uh, the blood test is not uh, a good blood test a complete blood test uh, it's getting better it used to be that they would just do a PCV and a white cell differential and and tell you yeah he looks okay he looks fine or here's a here's a blood tonic to pump up those uh, that hemoglobin or the, or the red cell count uh, they're getting better at that, but still, uh, more often than not, they don't give you the blood, a copy of the blood test results because they figure you're too damn dumb to know uh, what these blood tests mean. Um, you're not. Uh, it just takes uh, some study and some reading to, to find out. Uh, I've got a book out called The uh, 
racehorse owner survival manual that has uh, goes deeply into blood tests. But basically, the thing to know about PCV counts is you know that's that's your uh, 33 to 43 count that they give you. Oh, he's, he's at 40, he's great. Uh, oh, he's at 33, he's anemic. Uh, let's give him some injections uh, in the jug uh, of vitamin B and vitamin K and vitamin this or that. Uh, vitamin Q, you know, they have all sorts of little concoctions for you. But uh, really, uh, that PCV uh, is packed cell volume. It's, it tells you what percentage of the blood volume is red cells. And um, if, you, if the horse gets nervous and has a little adrenaline flowing in his system, he's going to squeeze part of his spleen and drop some red cells into that uh, bloodstream. And you're going to see uh, a higher count than normal. Uh, if he's real calm when you take it, he's light and he's real fit when you take it because uh, he's uh, been uh, expanding the capacity of, ex of his spleen to store red blood cells, uh, then you're liable to see, you know, the fitter they get, the lower the uh, uh, PCV is going to go because more and more of a percentage of the red blood cells are going to be stored in the spleen for injection into the bloodstream uh, when, when they're needed. So uh, you're liable to see a real low count, but then if you see a real low count, don't start giving tonics and stuff like that. Say, hey, Doc, I'm going to go out and sprint them for a quarter mile, and I'm going to bring them back in, and let's see what the count is then. And uh, you'll probably see uh, 55 uh, count, which is fine. And you get up in, much higher than that, and you get into that sludging effect that I was telling you about before. You don't want many more blood. That's why blood doping, which is taking a pint of your blood and sticking it in the refrigerator until race day and then sticking it back into your all the red cells back into yourself to really increase your oxygen, that doesn't help with horses because they've got the spleen to do that. And if you get too many red blood cells in there, then it just plugs up all the vessels and, and or, or a bunch of the vessels and, and nothing really gets circulated. So that's why that's a bad, bad idea with horses. Um, the monocyte count in your horse, now there's, there's all different kinds of white cells and basically they tell you about whether or not your horse, if you've got an elevated white count then you've got an infection of some kind, the horse is fighting off, the immune system has been jerked into play and you're fighting some invasive uh, uh, disease or an infection. And uh, one of the cells that goes to work uh, on some occasions is the monocyte. Now, uh, the monocyte's a very special cell. It's a young white cell, and they appear, normally they're at uh, 2%, uh, or the count is between 0 and 5. Uh, you get up you can get up to 15% of monocyte counts in a horse that has uh, a syndrome we call progressive fatigue where uh, tissues are breaking down faster than they're repairing over a long period of time, you know, let's say a month. Uh, you're racing every week, uh, suddenly your horse starts to get lethargic and tired or sore, muscle sore or something like this. One of the indicators of too much training or too much racing or just an overpowering amount of drawing down uh, is that the monocyte count starts to exceed 5 and starts to go up around 10, 12, uh, we've seen them as high as 15. And basically that's, uh, you might call it tired blood. Uh, basically what it is, is, uh, and it's not really have anything to do with the blood, but uh, more with the muscles and the enzymes that are available and the chemicals that are available in the body, they're, they're all sucked down. And it takes about two weeks to recover from that. It's not a very big deal, uh, but you do need to stop then because uh, as you go on, uh, the tissues get weaker and weaker, and then something is is going to blow. Uh, and it's better to, instead of starting to think, well, he's cheating on me or he got a bad drive or thinking of the 101 excuses for losing a race, you better start looking at uh, that blood. And, and it's good uh, to begin with to get a whole week cycle of blood on a given horse. Let's say you've got a horse in training, he's crossing 220, he's looking good, feeling good, everything's perfect in him. 
it would be nice to get a week's worth of blood of a horse going through a work day, a recovery day, uh, another recovery day, a super compensation day, another work day, and get that cycle of recovery rebound uh, uh, down in blood so you can see what his normal reactions to high levels of exercise and then low levels in uh, in recovery are if you've got a baseline for this horse and you've got it on a piece of paper then later on uh, and that means taking a blood test every day at the same time in the morning every day and getting a full test and it'll cost you uh, these tests might cost you sixty seventy dollars each uh, for that week, but then you'll have a baseline so that later on when you're going through uh, a period where you don't really know what's going on, but something's going wrong and the blood might tell you something, then you'll be able to take a blood test and compare it to normals for this horse and see what's off. And that'll help you diagnose, uh, or at least it'll eliminate some of the 10,000 causes for the problem. Uh, it'll eliminate the chemistry uh, and it'll eliminate if infections and this type of thing. Another thing that goes wrong is uh, every horse known to mankind is on Lasix these days, except for those racing in, in New York. Uh, Lasix is a diuretic. Um, it's not a coagulant. Uh, it's not uh, something that stops bleeding. Uh, basically, it changes the uh, blood volume and the characteristic, characteristics of the blood so that uh, when uh, the horse does uh, bleed, he bleeds less. And it's not because uh, you're solving the bleeding problem, it's just that he has less blood volume to bleed. Meanwhile, when you give him this drug, uh, he pisses all of his minerals on the ground every time you give it to him. So all of the nutrition that you're putting into him in terms of vitamin and minerals gets flushed out. Uh, and that means over a period of time you get cell deterioration. The nutrients aren't there, the micronutrients aren't there, the minerals aren't there, and you get general deterioration body-wide until pretty soon you, you walk him out the door and he starts to bleed right there in front of you because uh, his tissues are all shot to hell. Um, Lasix also appears to be somewhat of a hop in terms of perf improving performance uh, in a race when it's given at least the first couple three times. Uh, maybe, maybe not. That's still up, up for grabs, but at least one paper says it is. It's not a good thing any more than uh, corticosteroids are a good thing for your horse. Uh, again, it's your decision as to when your horse is going to fade away from the racing scene. If you want to make it happen quicker, use Lasix. Uh, if you've got one more race to go and uh, you've got a, a beat-up old cripple who bleeds like a uh, fire hose, then hit him with everything you can hit him that you, you can get away with and race that one last race. If he's still alive, you can take him home, put him out in the field, or uh, sell him to the Amish or something like that. But if you plan for a long-term career, uh, keep the needle away from your horse. Keep the needle away from your horse. Now, there are some kinds of injuries that are uh, easy to get over with or uh, allow the horse to keep going, or certainly the prognosis is good later on for the horse to come back from. Uh, ankle chips and knee chips generally are that kind of a uh, problem. Um, joint problems that are really joint problems, basically wraparound problems where you can feel the heat. Uh, in the ankle and it's a little bit rounded but it's rounded all the way around. It's not a local hot spot with a big bulge in, in one place. Uh, those things can be treated with uh, uh, ice, uh, can be treated with uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, adequan, and kept under control for a relatively long period of time be before they become uh, critical. Uh, w when your horse is lame, though, in an ankle, uh, it's time to stop and pull that chip out or stop and let that cartilage regrow or stop and let that fluid come back to normal. If you've got real light fluid in there, hyaluronic acid is only good for a few days and uh, it'll go back to where it was. And if, you, if you're dreaming that uh, you've cured it with this uh, injection, you're going to be real sorry when you find out two weeks later that now you've got much worse ankles than you had before because you thought you did something that you didn't really uh, accomplish. 
So uh, while you can get away with ankles for a long time, uh, be real careful and be and be looking at them every day and and avoid covering up things that you want to see. In other words, all this leg wrapping and things like that. If you're treating legs for a problem that you know is there, it's good uh, for for a time to wrap and squeeze some of the, the major inflammation out of there. In fact, that's one of the best things you can do for a tendon that is, that is freshly bowed is to uh, get ice on it real quick and keep that blood from flowing in there and then pooling in, in the torn parts of the tendon um, so that later on these little dark patches show up in the ultrasound scanning. Those dark patches, boy, if they're in there in big populations, that tendon is likely not to heal for a long time because that, that's red blood cells that get hard and, uh, and stay there and irritate the area and keep coming back to haunt you months later. So, you know, there are some things you want to attack and, and, and make look better but, and feel better, but the treatments are actually uh, useful. Most of the time, leg wraps and poluses and things like that are covering up more than they're, than they're helping. Uh, DMSO and cortisone on the outside of the skin will certainly cut into inflammation uh, real quickly and probably will not do a lot of... Uh, uh, interior damage like like cortisone stuck into a joint will do uh, but there's just so much of that you can do before you start covering up things that you really want to see you want to see if those ankles are going to get puffy every morning if they are uh, then it's time to start making decisions about well do we stop now and keep this horse healthy or rehabilitate him and bring him back or do we go on, uh, tighten them up as best we can, and go on and race the last three or four races of the season? Then hopefully, cross our fingers, we've still got uh, a viable animal next year. Or maybe we can sell them in a claiming race. Or maybe this owner that came down last week that said he'd pay us $40,000 for a horse would be willing to pay $40,000 for him at the end of these next three. You know, you can think of all those uh, kind of problems as you're as you're worrying about how to treat known injuries, but uh, in the end, uh, preservation of the horse's ability probably pays off better than uh, all the temporary things that we think we're doing right uh, that eventually prove to be what was the, f the straw that broke the camel's back. One more race, uh, one more high-speed workout, and wham, it's over and, and, his, and his career is over. Okay, let's say that you've got all the lameness problems under control or being investigated or maybe your horse is not lame at all and is going correctly and uh, looks gorgeous to you, uh, except that uh, when he races, something goes wrong. Uh, when he races, he races short. He goes three quarters of a, quarters of a mile and is all done or he n doesn't have the quickness and never is with uh, the rest of the pack at the level he's, that he's racing and runs a nice evenly rated mile but it's uh, 31, 31, 31, 31 in a race that's going in 29, 29, 29, 29. Um, solving those kinds of problems uh, is, is sometimes a conditioning thing, sometimes uh, a glycogen loading thing. We talked about that in, in an earlier tape. Uh, but let's, let's assume that it's a conditioning thing, and let's assume that we're dealing with a horse like this thoroughbred uh, who just didn't have it. Uh, what can you do in the middle of a season uh, to uh, improve that that horse enough so that he can sustain his speed for the for the whole distance um, first thing to know is that in the middle of a racing season the best you can hope for uh, with the level of condition of conditioning that you can get accomplished in the middle of a racing season and still be racing periodically uh, the best you can hope for is one more eighth of strong performance that's the very best you can hope for so if your horse can race seven eighths of a mile and, and quits then, great. If he races only three quarters of a mile, uh, you're going to get seven eighths out of him uh, at the kind of speed that he is capable of doing, and then he's going to stumble home. And uh, if you've got a full quarter to make up, then 
uh, you better put them into a, a different class of uh, racehorses because you're never going to get a full quarter difference in terms of uh, sustained ability. Uh, if he's got 27 ability and he does 327s for you, that's pretty damn spectacular. But uh, And then he does a 32. Uh, somewhere in the middle, you may be able to get a 29 out of that last quarter, but you're never going to get a fourth 27. If he does fourth, let's do it more reasonable. Four 29s is what you're looking for, and you got three 29s and a 32. Uh, you may be able to pick up uh, a 30, uh, but you're unlikely to pick up um, uh, a fourth 29. Uh, there's just so much you can do with a little bit of exercise. And in the case of uh, quitting early, uh, it's it's that old uh, combination of not having in practice recruited en enough muscle cells, down, dug deep down fur far enough into the muscle so that all the secondary troops, all the backup troops, uh, reserve troops have been activated and fueled up and taught to tolerate lactic acid. Uh, you didn't go deep enough like this guy. He went, he zipped, did a shallow prep. He went, had a horse that was real strong at four miles at a slow rate, but he never got down to the faster rates and dug deep into those muscle cells and showed the horse a whole lot of lactic acid so that, and he was afraid to because this, this horse had come off. This is one of our bowed tendon horses that uh, took a year to repair. He's back. He went through a, uh, a pretty aggressive training program. He's racing and his tendon is, is fine. The guy I took a whole year to do it, but he was timid when it came to the crunch, which is those multiple three quarters uh, that really uh, can approach uh, critical fatigue. He chickened out there, and so he's got a three quarter mile horse, and he may be able to get an extra eighth of a mile, but he'll never get a full mile out of this, out of this, uh, this animal, at least do it from the position he's coming from right now, racing. Uh, and that's the situation with quitters or with horses that uh, are short, is you can get a little bit. And the way to, to go after it is to um, forget about changing tissue. You don't have time. The races will help to a degree. Over a period of several months, you'll get uh, more and more mitochondria in there. But that's that's you can't... Um, uh, change those tissues uh, quickly. What you can do, though, is dig deep into fast twitch muscle, so muscle cells and get them activated and fueled. And you do that, the best way to do that is with a full, uh, in interval training, is a full six-half workout, a tough workout that may, this Saturday, dope him down a little bit so he performs even worse, but uh, or skip this Saturday and do one work on Wednesday and one work on Saturday and get those six halves in so that you're digging deep into the animal's uh, fast twitch muscle cells. That'll help, and that, that should tack on after maybe three workouts, you'll tack on that extra eighth of a mile. And you might even pick up some extra speed so that instead of 29, 29, 29, 30, you go 28, 29, 29, 30, okay? Um, those six halves will do that. Uh, there's no use going back to multiple three quarters um, for um, tissue change uh, in terms of tolerance for lactic acid. Now, uh, showing six halves and showing big lactic acid numbers, you'll get a chemical change. You'll get better buffering of the uh, uh, lactic acid, uh, but you will not get mitochondria out there doing, eating up and using that lactic acid for fuel. It's going to pile up no matter what you do. So the best thing you can do is dig down deeper into more and more muscle cells so that when the first echelon gets paralyzed or runs out of fuel, the next group comes in and takes over, and then the next group, and then the next group, and hopefully you don't run out of muscle cells before the end of the race. If you're a quarter mile off, you will run out of muscle, cell, muscle cells, but you'll run, off, run out of them uh, about an eighth of a mile further along in the race than you are right now. So if you're in the pack, uh, you could bring a winner out of this uh, situation. If you clear at the tail end, if, you, if you're if you at the front at the three-quarter pole and then you're dead last at the end of the race, uh, find a different class for the horse and still go after the six halves and somewhere in the middle you're, you'll meet with a class that he can do uh, well in uh, and still be a better horse than he was when he was finishing dead last in this particular class you're racing in now. 
the six halves is also a solution for the, well, let me not say six halves, halves are uh, a solution for the slow horse, the incurably slow horse, and usually these are big horses uh, that just can't spin up their legs uh, uh, quick enough. Um, the solution for the grinder then is um, multiple half miles separated by longer rest periods. In other words, here it's not a problem of um, lactic acid tolerance or anything like that. It's just pure speed that we're looking for. And so you start training the horse like a sprinter. Uh, spr sprinters don't do interval training. Uh, Carl Lewis doesn't do interval training per se. He does repetitions. And repetitions are different than intervals in that when we're talking about intervals, we're talking about that rest period in between being squeezy so that uh, from heat to heat, the lactate buildup goes up. In repetitions, the intervals are open. Full recovery uh, uh, time periods between uh, uh, each heat. Now, if you want to do uh, a four or five or six half workout with uh, open rest period so that your horse is fully recovered. Let's say you do 10 minute rest periods instead of 5 minute rest periods. So that your horse is fully recovered in between, then the result of that workout is going to be that the uh, horse will be able to perform all of those halves faster and still uh, survive the workout. The rule still applies that uh, when the horse starts to slow down and starts to come back to you, the workout's over whether you're at 4 halves, 5 halves, or 6. But usually you can get through a whole six-half workout if you open up those rest periods in between. Now, if you're doing that, if you decide to do that, then what you've got to recognize is that in between those heats, uh, those fast-twitch muscle cells are filling back up with fuel to an extent that might carry them pretty well into the next half mile. And in doing so, this is lactic acid being reconverted back to uh, glycogen and refilling those muscle cells. That means you're not going to be digging as, as deeply down uh, uh, into the muscle in terms of exhausted muscle cells turning over the job to uh, fresh muscle cells. But one thing you will be doing is that the horse will be able to go faster because he's not facing the kind of uh, fatigue that he would in an interval workout. Uh, with full open rest periods, then uh, he'll be able to fire. There'll be more muscle cells to fire at any one time, and those extra muscle cells available will thrust him forward faster. In other words, how many muscles do you contract at one time? That's power. So the more he can contract at one time, the more power he has. And the first few heats are always a little bit slower than the rest because uh, you're opening up blood vessels and you're, you're opening up lines of communications to muscle cells. But that, you get into four heats or five heats uh, with this horse and you'll find that he is really contracting a whole lot of muscle cells and is able to go much faster on that fourth or fifth half mile than he would have been if you had kept those uh, rest periods tighter. And what that means is that you're training specifically for speed and you will get some speed. Uh, how much uh, speed you'll get uh, is uh, depends on the horse and his his rate of acquisition. Uh, but uh, definitely, you'll see an improvement if you've got a horse that needs speed by opening up the rest periods uh, between those half miles. And and don't worry about miles. Don't worry about three quarters. You're not going fast enough in those. Uh, to get this uh, increased speed effect, it's half miles that's going to that's going to do it, do it for you here. Uh, let's talk about this uh, acquisition thing for a minute. Uh, some horses have good acquisition, and some horses don't have uh, good acquisition, and so. Uh, a game plan or a corrective game plan that worked on one horse may or may not work on another horse. Or if it does work, it may take longer time uh, than uh, on a horse that you tried it on previously. Um, don't come to any uh, hasty conclusions about uh, any animal you're training. And always uh, remember that uh, the horse is always plastic. In other words, the horse is always changeable. 
depending on what you decide to do with a horse. Uh, we just talked about horses not being able to be stretched more than about an eighth of a mile if you're racing them, but that's only because you're racing them, and that's because every weekend they've got to go out and do something to earn their uh, keep. If it wasn't like that, and if you had the time to rebuild the horse, uh, he's plastic, he'll change, and he'll change forever until he's about nine years old, ten years old, and then the ability, the acquisition, starts to go away and a piece of work doesn't uh, produce uh, the kind of conditioning effect that, uh, that you really want to see. But until then, uh, you've got a horse that's plastic and uh, when you decide to stop trying to improve the horse, that's a limit that you're setting on the horse, not a limit that the horse has within him. He may be slow to respond to exercise, but there is no doubt that he will. Now if you look at a horse that's slow to respond to exercise at 2.30 and can't break a 2.30 barrier, well then you better start thinking about getting rid of that horse right now because uh, that's way too early to, to have uh, plateau problems except with a trotter that's not balanced or except with a pacer that's not gated properly and not, not liking the hobbles. Uh, has those hobbles too short and has taken uh, twice as many steps to get around that track as, as everybody else or hasn't got his head set right, or has got a tooth problem, you know, there's 10 million, but assuming no problems, and you get a horse that's, that's trainable, but won't train, but won't come around, won't respond to the exercise, at 2.30, it's time to get rid of him. But if you get a horse down at two minutes, and he's a viable racehorse, and he's out there making some money, uh, you know he has acquisition enough to be a, a competitive racehorse. So it's worth honing, and it's worth tightening uh, with a variety of different kinds of workouts, tightening to solve the, the minor problems that he has uh, in terms of lack of speed or lack of stay or uh, inability to take the turns properly. Uh, they can learn these things. Practice makes perfect. Uh, uh, they can be changed and uh, never give up. Never give up on a horse that you're going to stay with, that's going to stay with you. Never give up on A, solving his problems uh, through conditioning, or B, solving his problems uh, by way of eliminating causes of them. Uh, uh, again, right back to the feet. Fix the feet and you'll get an advantage. Uh, you might get a last quarter out of a racehorse if you find out that he's running on 47s or 46 and a 49. I've seen this in standard brains. And you bring them gradually both up to 50-50 or 51-51, uh, you'll get an extra quarter mile out of that horse just because of that shoeing change and it'll have nothing to do with training, training at all. If you've got a real skinny horse that's uh, 100 pounds underweight, you can see the ribs, you can see the hips, you can see the backbone, hey, just feed the horse and you'll get an extra quarter mile full bore let's, or maybe more uh, out of a horse that's plumped up and, uh, and, and fueled up. These problems are real easy problems to solve compared to lameness problems. You know, once you hurt a horse, uh, it's too bad because uh, those kinds of problems are, are just not as fixable as uh, problems in, in, in conditioning and problems in gating and problems in, in, in mental things. Now some mental things are, are real difficult to uh, solve and sometimes you can't solve uh, solve them but a lot of them we cause and so we can avoid causing them but by uh, putting a horse through uh, too much too soon, too much exposure to stress, uh, mental stress, uh, just because we think it's time. You know, you watch their minds, you watch their bodies. Uh, there's no need to be a psychologist to uh, figure out that, hey, you're putting so much pressure on this filly that she's sweating every time she sees you, she starts to shake every time you walk by her stall. Uh, or she sticks with her head in the back of the stall and goes off feed or does all it gives you all the other signs that hey you're you're pushing the button one too many times you listen to that and you back up a little bit and instead of listening to the owner and the owners I hope there's owners watching this because uh, if you're pushing the trainer who's who's telling you hey this filly doesn't want it she's not ready give me a couple more weeks give me a couple more months if you don't hear that and that filly gets hurt, or that filly never races well because of an attitude, washing out or tying up or whatever, it's your fault. It's your fault. Uh, you didn't hear your horseman telling you that. Now, 
uh, hopefully your horseman's got enough intelligence to watch some things like this and improve all, all around on his uh, on his uh, knowledge. But believe me, when your guy is telling you she's not ready for that and you say go, you're making a mistake. Uh, there is an art, and if you've if you've chosen your trainer with with some care, uh, you've got a guy that's got the picture in his mind, and he'll see something that doesn't fit his picture. And if you don't hear him when he's telling you that, uh, you will pay the price, and deservedly so. It's your fault. You know, hey, let's admit it when it's our fault. <laughs> I made mistakes. You'll make mistakes. Uh, the more of them you make that are less costly, uh, the better off you are uh, if you intend to hang around for a while. Here's something else that can go wrong that you ought to know about. Uh, and this is on the racetrack. Uh, racing tactics. We were just talking about sprinters and stayers. A horse with a lot of speed that wants to quit. A horse with no speed that can go all day, but not quite uh, where everybody else is. And then there's a, there is the final horse that we're all looking for, is the real fit horse that uh, we don't want to win by 20 lengths. We want to win by half a length every time. Uh, so we fit him up so that, he, so that he could win by 10 lengths, but we never test him. The ideal, that's the ideal situation, is that you really never test your athlete. But let's say you're in the uh, championship race and you're racing for a million dollars and this guy over here has got 26 speed coming out of the gate uh, and your horse is, uh, this horse's final time on a mile is in 154, but uh, he's got some screaming speed now and you've got a real fit horse that can go 153 uh, but can't make uh, 26 speed out of the gate. Uh, what do you do? Well. If that guy takes his sprinter out to the top, then it's your job not to wait to finish at the end of the race, but rather get up on his back and press and press and press and make that 26 speed drive itself into the ground. That The defect in a sprinter is that he can't sustain that speed. And if he goes out with that speed and <laughs> He wants to beat you, and he's smart. What he'll do is he'll go out of that speed and then back everybody up. And you've seen uh, guys do this at the, at the track, and, of course, the stewards uh, set them down again because they're crazy. They don't know what the hell's going on. They think you're cheating. Uh, and that's the stewards' paranoia because uh, if it appears to be cheating, that's what they care about. It's not whether it is cheating or not. If it appears to be cheating, they solve their problem by making you stand up and look like every other little Indian in the, in the row. Anyway, the sprinter's job, if he's doing his job correctly, is to go out front, control the race, shut it down, stop everybody from hitting those 26s, and hit some 30s. And then when your fit horse comes up alongside, he steps on the gas and gives you another 26 that you cannot match. And that's how sprinters win uh, real competitive races. The idea of beating a sprinter is to drive his nose into the ground so that he does he can't come up with another 26 at the end of the race. In other words, if you're pushing uh, steady 27s at him, uh, he'll still die. Uh, he he needs a breath. He needs time for that lactic acid to drop a little bit in the middle of that race. If if he goes out fast, um, so in in tactics, uh, you can ruin a race by taking your your speed horse and flashing him at everybody and going to the half mile in a in a in a screaming speed, you know a 52 half is a horse that it's not going to finish uh, in most cases. So uh, with your sprinter, uh, go out, grab the front, and shut him down. And if the steward puts you down to it, explain to him, show him this videotape. Uh, let let Tom Ivers tell him he's an idiot for for doing that to you. If you've got a fit horse that can stay but doesn't have exotic speed, uh, then your job is to stay right there, uh, not in front, but right in that uh, three or four horses back. And if anybody, if he starts slowing down, then you go out and uh, try to go by him. Now, what he'll do is he'll kick it in again, and he'll go head to head, and you'll be parked. But again, you've got the fit horse. He's got the shallow horse with a lot of uh, cheap speed, okay, and you'll bury him. And there's another interesting physiological factor to this is that uh, horses with co competition on their shoulder uh, 
perform with higher heart rates and fatigue faster than horses that have broken uh, contact and are out three lengths in front. Uh, they don't have uh, as hard a job as horses that have somebody breathing right over their shoulder. The, the stress factor, the heart rate factor, the uh, adrenaline uh, uh, fatigues quickly, especially sprinters. So that if you're up on his shoulder breathing down his neck uh, at the half mile, uh, his heart, heart rate's going to be 10 points higher than it would have been if you were back three lanes and waiting for and biding your time waiting for him to drop down. Uh, you'll fatigue him faster. Now that's a physiological fact uh, that if you watch races where this happens you'll see that uh, a hard race for a, a front-end horse is when everybody's right there with him. Uh, that's when he'll tend to lose. When he, If he can break contact and get five, six lengths out in front, uh, generally he has a fearless mile and uh, he'll get away with it. Now if you've got the fittest and the fastest horse uh, in the race, then basically the safest and smartest thing to do is an evenly rated race, 29, 29, 29, 29, uh, cruising. If you can get out of traffic and, and get the front end, then just go steady at those speeds. That's the easiest thing on the fit horse is a steady, anytime you're speeding up and slowing down, speeding up and slowing down, you're overcoming uh, inertia that exists from the slowness over and over and over again. Uh, the final thing about tactics is the uh, easiest time to pass, the least costly time to pass another horse is when it's going slowest. Now think about how a lot of races are run in this country. Uh, generally you'll see a fast front end and then you'll see a couple cruising quarters and then you'll see let's go to the finish. Okay. Now those cruising quarters are the easiest and least costly place to pass your competition. Okay. If it goes out too fast, then those middle two quarters are going to be exhaust quarters, and maybe the last quarter will be the time to pass everybody. But if you've got a nice, evenly smooth, and nobody's pushing hard, everybody's just taking care of their horses, and you're at the half mile pole, it's time to move then. Okay, it's time to move right then, or coming out, or slinging out of that turn. If you're on a half mile track, slinging out of that turn and the uh, and coming across the home stretch, uh, passing everybody on the first time around. Uh, that's a real good time to make your move because usually nobody else is using their horses that hard, and they'll be surprised by you making that move. Uh, the hardest time to make a move and pass someone is right out of the gate when everybody's screaming to that first turn or coming from home when really everybody else is going slower too but your horse is tired and you're making maximum effort. Anytime you're making maximum effort, remember there's only three or four strides that your horse can make maximum effort before he really fades. So you don't want to uh, make maximum effort when everybody else is making it because then passing somebody is real difficult. If you can blow a couple lengths on somebody in the middle of the race and get to the front uh, and then struggle on home uh, uh, at your very best, uh, hey, when they start to try to pass you, they'll have a harder time of it uh, then than they, than they would have making up those two lengths at the middle when everybody was hitting 30s, you know. So don't pass when it's tough to pass. Uh, coming out of turns, it doesn't hurt to uh, not hug that rail. It costs, it costs to hug that rail. You can slingshot out from uh, behind somebody coming out of a turn and take advantage of the centrifugal force of that, uh, of that turn. So if there's room, uh, the best time to start to pass is coming out of a turn. Uh, and the worst time to start to pass is going into a turn. Those are some tactics for you. Okay, so the, the basic message here in this tape about what, what goes wrong is that you and I go wrong. Uh, again, we're in control of the horse 100%. Uh, what we decide happens, happens. Uh, if we're not wide awake, if we're not watching, if we're not diagnosing uh, things early and catching them early, or if we're making decisions that uh, will compromise the horse's performance uh, eventually or immediately or compromise the horse's health, 
uh, immediately or in the, in the long term, uh, then we deserve the results that, uh, that we get from that. Uh, what goes wrong is what goes wrong in our minds in terms of observation, record keeping, uh, deep thinking in terms of how to train, how to take care of problems, how to discover causes of problems. Uh, all that's within our capabilities and it's certainly not within the horse's capabilities. I hope you've uh, enjoyed these uh, four tapes. I know there's a lot of talk and a lot of uh, sometimes boring information in it, but uh, uh, what I hope that you'll do is eventually go back through these again and again and pick up one or more uh, little nuances of thought that you can extend and uh, go further with than I have. These are my thoughts. Basically, in these in these four tapes, you've you've got everything I know uh, and some things that uh, I'm mad about. But uh, take it on from here. Uh, see what you can do. See at the racetrack uh, with a with a fit, ready to roll, sound, happy racehorse, and good luck to you. Make some money.